Those of you that uh, I don't know, and I know most of you, my name's Linda Scott. I've got the great honour of being the President of Local Government New South Wales, and we really want to thank you for taking the time out this evening to um, be here. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, uh, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. It's really fantastic to be with you all here this evening to talk about a really important topic for us all. Uh, it's particularly good, thank you very much to the Attorney General, Mark Speckman, for being here. We're very grateful for you for being able to be here. Uh, as I said, Phyllis Miller, the Mayor of Forbes from my local government, New South Wales Board, and a range of other mayors and councillors from across New South Wales, thank you so much for being here. I know uh, for many of you who are elected, your cutting your time finally between uh, joint organisation chair meetings and country mayors association and a range of other local government meetings. So um, we have scheduled this tonight to try and maximise the large number of regional uh, councillor um, uh, and mayors who are in town. So we're very grateful for you for taking the time to be here in particular. It's also great to have Melissa Gibbs here from the Office of Local Government and Marty Pollock from the Department of Communities and Justice, along with all council staff in the room who are working particularly, we note, after hours to attend this important briefing. We're only going to focus tonight on one outcome of the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sex Abuse, and that, of course, is the National Redress Scheme. Uh, I know you'll understand why. The Commission, of course, was established in 2012. Uh, it ran for five years. And during this time, it heard from survivors of institutional child abuse in 8,013 private sessions reviewed written responses from 1,000 survivors, held 57 public hearings and produced 59 research reports. And of course, the gravity of its findings just cannot be overstated. Uh, it's of course the case that not all uh, institutional child abuse crimes heard by the Commission occurred in the past. And of course, recent survivors, including some still children, were also part of this process. It's also not the case that a limited number of institutions were exposed during the Commission. Nearly 4,000 institutions were the subject of allegations of abuse. The institutions cut right across all parts of society, the private sector, community organisations and government-run sectors. And the highest proportion of survivors heard by the Royal Commission were abused in out-of-home care, one third were abused in institutions under government management. So many shocking statistics. The Commission found that victims were failed when leaders prioritised institutional reputations over the safety of children. And the final report states that poor practices, inadequate government structures, failure to record and report complaints and understanding the seriousness of complaints have been frequent. So we all acknowledge collectively that there was a failure. And I know everyone is here tonight because you're all determined to help ensure our public institutions don't fail again. And as leaders in our local government spheres, we're all very, very committed to ensuring that in particular, local governments do everything we possibly can to ensure these failures don't occur at local governments. A necessary component in responding to the Royal Commission's findings is to ensure justice and compensation for survivors. And so, of course, this is part of the National Redress Scheme on which our speakers will expand this evening. An equally important component is implementing changes to workplace culture and workplace practices. Institutions, including local governments, are being asked to implement 10 child safe principles established by the Royal Commission in order to become child safe. The aim of the child safe institutions is not only to prevent harm to children, but to actively support their wellbeing by including their rights and voice wherever possible. Recommendation 6.12 of the Commission is that local government should appoint a staff member to take on the role of a child safety officer. We, on behalf of all the councils, made a submission on the subject of child safety to the Children's Guardian, who leads the move to ensure New South Wales institutions are child safe 
and our input on the sector's behalf was heard and acted upon, particularly with regards to the resources and training sessions offered by the Office of Children's Guardian. So please make sure if you'd like to learn more about making your council a child safe institution or about implementing the Children's Guardian Act, um, which commenced on the 1st of March, just last Sunday, you do that today, because we now all have that legislation applying to us. But in the interim, I th hope that you'll find this forum really informative. Uh, as leaders of our institutions, we now have the ability, but also the responsibility for apologising for past wrongdoings. Uh, and just to clarify that, because I have had some people question me about this, uh, as a mayor, you may be asked to personally apologise to a past victim of the institution that you lead. So it's very, very important that as a result of tonight, mayors in particular, but also councillors and council staff understand these obligations and understand what this means for us all. We must also make sure we put in place a system to respond to and of course hopefully prevent any future instances of institutional child abuse. And again, it's commendable that you've all shown your willingness to be here tonight to discuss and learn more about this incredibly important matter. Our children, our institutions, the very future of our New South Wales citizens, of course, deserve no less. So with all that, it's now my great pleasure to introduce the Attorney General, the Honourable Mark Speakman. Under his stewardship, New South Wales joined Victoria as the first two states to pass the legislation required to enter the National Redress Scheme. He also oversaw measures to ensure survivors of child abuse in New South Wales institutions had access to unlimited counselling and psychological support, something that's just fantastic, I'm sure you'll all agree. Please welcome the Attorney General to the microphone. Thank you, Linda, and uh, good evening, everybody. Could I also acknowledge we gather on Gadigal land and uh, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, thank you, Linda, for this invitation. We spoke about this uh, late last year, about the desirability of getting a forum together for, for mayors and other council officers and elected representatives uh, to share information with local councils about what it means to be uh, part of the National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse. Uh, so that's what we're talking about tonight, uh, the redress scheme and what it means for your councils to be, have been declared participating New South Wales state institutions. I'll come back to the scheme in a moment, but I'll just touch on some aspects of the Royal Commission that, uh, into institutional responses to child abuse that uh, Linda spoke about. Uh, it was uh, established in 2013. It was a five-year inquiry. Uh, Linda has given you some of the, the shocking statistics. Uh, three and a half thousand institutions in Australia, three and a half thousand, uh, were found to have evidence of child sexual abuse in those institutions. Uh, just, a, just a staggering uncovering by that Royal Commission. Uh, the revelations were staggering, the depravity, the extent of it, staggering. Uh, many heartbreaking stories. Uh, and what we know, uh, and perhaps didn't realise back in the 60s and 70s, is the lifelong consequences the child abuse uh, has for victims and survivors. Um, there were 409 recommendations. Uh, they were very powerful and far-reaching recommendations to the Commonwealth, recommendations to the states and territories and also to non-government institutions about what we can do to protect children and to deliver justice and support for survivors. Uh, the state government has accepted the overwhelming majority of those recommendations. Uh, they cover like vast areas of government. Uh, one of the things we have done is introduced poss possibly uh, one of the most significant packages of criminal justice reforms that New South Wales has ever seen. For example, we've introduced a new uh, offence of failing to report child sexual abuse, failing to protect against child sexual abuse. Uh, we've changed sentencing principles so that judges now have to apply modern sentencing standards where we know so much more about the lifelong impact of child sexual abuse rather than uh, uh, antiquated and ill-informed standards of the 60s and 70s. Uh, this week we introduced into Parliament uh, legislation that will make it easier to uh, tender evidence of uh, similar facts and uh, what might would otherwise be said to be coincidences to make it easier to, to prosecute child sexual abuse, uh, particularly where in many of these cases it's one word against another. It's the, uh, often someone in a great position of power and reputation on the one hand, 
uh, and a survivor on the other hand who has no witnesses, often traumatised, uh, can't necessarily give uh, the best evidence uh, possible to allow witnesses of similar circumstances to give evidence as well. Um, apart from criminal justice reform, we've seen civil justice reform here in New South Wales. We got rid of the limitation period. Uh, there was an obstacle to, to many uh, claimants uh, because we know that typically it takes over 20 years for a claimant uh, to be able to uh, have, the, have the stamina and the strength uh, to make their claim. Uh, we've uh, introduced a proper defendant rule so that uh, institutions can't, behind, can't hide behind um, um, what might be a, a church structure with different dioceses and priests who aren't employees or, or a myriad of trust to avoid liability. Uh, and this week we've released a discussion paper uh, about uh, opening up unjust settlements, settlements that were made uh, before we got rid of the limitation period, before we introduced this proper defendant so that uh, a court could open up those settlements. And there's a discussion paper that's come out this week uh, where we've got six weeks for submissions. Um, one of the important recommendations of the Royal Commission was a nat national redress scheme because we know civil litigation uh, for most people, let alone traumatised victim survivors of child sexual abuse, uh, is a very difficult and expensive and time consuming process. So the idea of the National Redress Scheme was to afford um, quicker, low docs or no docs justice for victim survivors uh, in a way that didn't see them dragged through the courts for years and years. Uh, the recommendation was a single National Redress Scheme uh, New South Wales with Victoria was uh, one of the first two states to opt into that scheme uh, in March 2018 and in May 2018 we were the first state to refer our powers to the Commonwealth so the national scheme um, could operate. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not a compensation scheme. Um, for, for some survivors they will still um, be better advised to go to the courts and uh, claim damages for hundreds of thousands of dollars or, or possibly more. Uh, it's, it's meant to be a redress and healing scheme which has three key components. Uh, the first is a recognition payment of up to $150,000 uh, as a tangible means of recognising the wrongs that have been suffered. Uh, the third is access to counselling and psychological support. Uh, and the third is a direct personal response from the participating institution or institutions responsible. Uh, the Commonwealth, uh, through the Department of Social Services, uh, operates the scheme. Uh, and here in New South Wales, we've got a central coordination team uh, within the Department of Communities and Justice's Victim Services uh, coordinating the New South Wales response. Um, for a survivor to access the scheme, uh, the responsible institution has to participate. Uh, so in that sense, it's an opt-in scheme. Uh, and uh, many uh, significant institutions, the major churches, for example, have opted in. Uh, there are still a few um, recalcitrants, if I can call them that, that we're waiting, waiting to opt in. But now all the states and territories have jumped on board uh, and uh, all, are, all are participating in this national scheme. Uh, and the non-government organisations that aren't participating have until 30 June to decide whether or not they're participating. Uh, when the scheme started, there was a declaration that listed categories of what were New South Wales uh, state institutions, government departments, public schools, state-run children's homes, and initially local councils weren't included. Uh, but the overriding objective of the scheme is to make sure that all survivors of institutional child abuse, child sexual abuse, have access to redress. Uh, as Linda mentioned, um, about a third of those who uh, attended private sessions of the Royal Commission uh, and were the victim survivors of child sexual abuse uh, had been abused in government institutions, so that's about a third, uh, and about 1%, 1.2% had reported abuse in a local government institution. Uh, so the New South Wales government decided that uh, the declaration about state institutions should extend to local councils. Uh, in making that decision, um, we have tried to minimise the financial impact on you. So we will pick up the tab for the, the, the payment, the monetary payment of $150,000. Uh, we will pick up the tab for uh, counselling and psychological support. Uh, but the direct personal response, which is a really important part of the, of the therapy and the healing, uh, we ask councils to provide that. Uh, it doesn't mean that um, you know, the person who gives that is accepting you know, personal culpability. 
uh, you, you, it is a response on behalf of an institution, and it's, I think, so important uh, for victim survivors not just to get money or a counsellor, but to have the institution uh, acknowledge the wrong uh, that they've suffered. Um, how the scheme works, an, ap an applicant for redress lodges uh, an application with the scheme operator at the Commonwealth. Uh, if, the if the application identifies a local council as being involved uh, or there are reasonable grounds to think that a council uh, was involved, uh, then the scheme operator will, in will issue our centre coordination team with a request for information or an RFI for short. Uh, and they request the institution to provide information that may be relevant to the application. Uh, and that helps the scheme's independent decision makers reach decisions. So the scheme employs independent decision makers to decide uh, whether to accept a redress application, um, what the redress should involve, and the applicant uh, has a, right of, a one right of review within six months to have another person, uh, another independent assessor, decision maker look at that if they're dissatisfied with the offer that's made. Um, not all survivors will want a direct personal response. Uh, for some survivors, uh, they want redress in the form of um, a, a payment and uh, counselling or, or psychological support, but they may, want have, they may want to have nothing to do with the institution that abused them. Others will, so you won't find a direct personal response uh, required in all cases. Uh, the form uh, is, is flexible. Um, it might take the form of, of a written apology. Uh, it might be meeting a senior person at the responsible institution. Um, or it might be none of that, it might be just an assurance that this won't ever happen again and a description of the sorts of steps that the institution has taken to avoid a repetition of child sexual abuse. Uh, but the response should include an acknowledgement of the impact uh, of the abuse uh, on the survivor. Um, so our Victim Services Central Coordination team is the central link for government agencies uh, and they're there to help you uh, when you receive an application under the scheme. Um, as the Royal Commission acknowledged in its final report, although we've got these stats that I've mentioned to you, we will probably never know uh, the true number of children who have been abused in Australian institutions. Uh, so as the chosen representatives of our communities, local and state, um, it's our responsibility to respond to what we have learnt through this inquiry. Uh, so that we can support the victim survivors and make sure that this never happens again. Uh, as I said, the human impact is deeply traumatic. It's not just traumatic for the victims and survivors, it's traumatic for uh, family members who have to, to, to live with traumatised victim survivors. Uh, lasting impacts right across the community. Uh, the redress scheme is one of the key ways that we can recognise this, uh, and it's designed to be practical, uh, but compassionate uh, to help survivors uh, on a very long journey uh, to healing and recovery. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I really appreciate the way that you ran us through the enormous impact, but also our sort of personal responsibility as lead of the, leaders of these institutions. I think that's what we're all here for tonight is to make sure we understand that, but also uh, to do that in a way that's sensitive and personalised to each individual who's been affected. Um, I know when I sit at my council table, I think about all the child care centres, uh, you know, for many of you in this room have uh, aged care centres. For so many of us, we have a really complex set of uh, organisations and institutions that we uh, either run as councils, we are partners with, we sponsor very, very complex structures, uh, local governments. And then when you look at the diversity across our state's 128 councils, it becomes even more complex. So I think uh, working through this process in all of our institutions is a very important one so that we can maximise uh, the best response for any victims that may come forward. We now are lucky to have Melissa Gibbs from the Office of Local Government who's going to speak to us a little bit about uh, working in collaboration with the State Government through the Office of Local Government uh, and the impact on local governments in New South Wales specifically. Please join with me in welcoming Melissa. Thanks, thanks, Linda. Uh, welcome, everybody. 
Um, I'm just here today to explain to you about the Office of Local Government's role in this. Um, you've heard about the scheme and how it runs and, and why, it was, um, why it was introduced, um, but I'm just here to talk about some of the operational aspects of the scheme so that if, um, if, if a claim is made, uh, you'll, you'll know what to expect from the Office of Local Government. So the Office of Local Government is the first central point of contact between the central coordination team and councils. And the Office of Local Government is geared up to assist councils when responding to requests for information and delivering the direct personal response. Um, so what happens is that the National Redress Scheme, the federal scheme, will review applications lodged by survivors and then they'll send a uh, request for information to the central coordination team in, uh, in New South Wales. Um, the request for information is then sent via, uh, via a portal to the relevant agency. And where a request for information is for a council, that will come to the Office of Local Government and the Office of Local Government will get in touch with the General Manager and provide an information pack and, um, and walk you through the process. Um, we will provide key information about the request for information. We'll meet with senior staff and the General Manager and, and, and as I said, walk you through the process of responding. Um, we'd, we'd ask a council to identify a senior staff member to work with the Office of Local Government on the request for information. And um, experience to date has, has shown that that might be somebody involved with legal, property, records, HR, um, or other staff, depending on, depending on um, the, the circumstances of each council. And we will ask councils to search their records for all information relating to the request for information and then um, ask the council to request, uh, to, to complete a, a questionnaire developed by the National Redress Scheme. Um, for council's part, uh, they, they need to, <coughs> excuse me, demonstrate that there's a process in place to protect the privacy of the survivor um, at all times and that um, information contained in any application is protected information under the redress legislation and it's an offence to share this information unless it's permitted under the Act. Uh, and searches conducted by nominated staff in response to a request for information are recorded and logged by the council officer coordinating the search. And um, councils will, will need to identify that the records that they keep um, are, are appropriately secure and um, that they have systems in place to, to protect the privacy of, of, uh, of the information that's kept. Um, OLG will work with the councils, as I said, throughout this process and, um, and ensure that, that the searches are undertaken in a way that complies with the requirements of the scheme. And um, we will then pass the information on to the central coordination team, uh, which will collate council's response with other, any, any other New South Wales agency response, uh, sorry, government response if appropriate, and then submit all that through the information portal um, that's been established by the Commonwealth Government. The request for information and information provided by the survivor is considered by an independent decision maker, as the Attorney General said, and, and that independent decision maker will determine whether there's a reasonable likelihood of uh, the, being, the, the person being eligible for redress. And if the independent decision maker determines that a survivor is eligible for recess, um, an offer will be made. Um, as uh, you've heard, the, the redress includes a payment of up to $150,000, counselling and a, um, an apology from the responsible institution. And if the survivor requests that apology, um, the central coordination team will inform the council and work with the council on how to deliver that apology. And uh, at all times, the apology and the response is directed towards the needs and the, and the desires of, of the survivor claimant. So, um, so far, we've been involved in, in just two cases. And um, what we've found to date in those cases is that the best thing for us to do is to come and um, have one of our team sit down, meet with senior council staff and talk, talk you through the process so that you'll understand what to expect. 
and um, and also just reinforce the privacy concerns and, and make sure that, that uh, you have all the support that you need in responding to the request. Um, we can provide on the ground um, guidance and, and learnings from other councils who have been invo involved in similar um, requests, while always, of course, um, protecting the, the privacy of individuals involved. Um, we've also found it's best if we limit the number of people involved working um, on the request for information to ensure the privacy and security of information. And, um, and we're aware that this, is, this can be a challenge in small and regional councils where, um, where the redress applicant and the alleged abuser may, uh, may still be living within the community together. Um, we found uh, that the searches that councils are required to undertake take around about four hours to finalise. So to date, the experience has been that it's not, it's not a, a huge impost in undertaking those searches. Um, but we also found that information can be found in, in quite unexpected places like uh, libraries, annual leave records, council or committee uh, minutes. And, um, and in some cases, that information may be stored in archives, which may need to be retrieved. Um, so the two cases that we've had to date, uh, one was in a metro area and one was in a regional area. And in both cases, the survivor um, contacted both the council and OLG asking for updates. And we were able to work with the council to make sure that the, the, um, all of the information was directed into the, um, to the, to the coordination team um, and, uh, and got back onto the appropriate um, process. In the case of the Metro Council, the matter revolved around a youth club from the 1970s and uh, property searches were um, uh, related to council business papers, HR records, and, um, and around about four people were involved in undertaking those searches, which as I said, took about four hours. And council was able to relatively quickly locate the, rel the uh, relevant information. And around about four hours, as I said, was taken, um, was required to complete the searches and the paperwork. The second case um, was in a regional council and um, council was able to identify its involvement in a council run facility and identify the information relating to the alleged offender via a history, a history book held in the council's library. And information in that book uh, led to further information searches such as committee meetings and employment records. And archival information in that case was also retrieved. And again, that council estimated about four hours of searching time and completing the relevant forms um, to, and location of the relevant material. Um, so that's all I had to say about, about how the scheme operates. Um, and just again to reassure you that um, that we're here, we're working with the, the central coordination team, and um, if a, if a claim is made, um, we'll be in touch and and be with you through the through the whole process.